there is this quote from Angela Davis, um, the activist, the author, who said, we have to think about liberating minds as well as society. In many ways, I feel that black academia and the work that you guys do is intrinsically activist. And I want to know if you in any way have ever thought of your work in that way. Yeah. I do. <clears throat> I truly believe, which is why I'm here, um, I'm a storyteller. And the more of you I can get to tell your stories, everybody's story isn't the same, but thematically, it's all relatable. It takes courage to learn the story of someone that's different than you. It takes dialogue. But I will tell you as a black woman to be in a room where people are afraid to say your name because it, it will take something from them for me, it invigorates me, especially as a documentarian, I'm going to tell that story, right? And so I look at it as an opportunity in everything that I do. What's your story? What's your story? Do you like your brother? Do you like your mother? There's, there's so many different things that we can collectively do and have that interaction. Um, so that's, that's the medium in which I believe I can communicate to the masses and create themes and messages that hopefully will become transformative and change the way we live. I didn't come to the academy to be an activist. I just, it's always been a part of who I am because I've always had to fight for space, fight for, for recognition, fight for being um, acknowledged, fight for being cited fight for um, theses that I developed, you know, within my own profession, all of those things. My activism really took root when I started speaking to um, wider audiences, which is something I've always done in my entire career. It was really important for me to speak for the kids that were coming behind me, the preschool, the, the, the kindergartners, the first K through 12, you know, pre-K through 12. And so I would always go and talk to the schools, teach them about African American history, and I was often invited during Black History Month. And I took it, like, I'm, I'm fine, it's an opportunity to educate. It's an opportunity to teach people about um, cultural experiences that, are, that may be different from those that were in the audience. Um, and then I started getting involved in uh, curriculum activism, you know, fighting for, because the textbook I, I grew up in had, you know, African American history was like this big, it was a paragraph. Um, and so I really want, I knew there were so many stories that weren't being told. And I decided I wanted to become a historian so I could tell more stories. And I write about people who have names and people who have numbers. Because I write about slavery. I write about people who aren't named in records, but they have created actions and they've done things that I think are worth telling their story even if you don't know their names. And I, I try to recognize and see those people. I can't say their names, but I can say what they did or how impactful they were. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I've spoken in front of school boards. I've done testimony in front of the state, uh, the, our federal government. Um, and I think that's where people would describe activism. But I think I've had a, a very quiet activism that's been in just my writing, in my publishing, um, doing reference books, encyclopedias. I've now done a middle school, a high school, and now I'm doing a college level textbook. And what I'm doing there is trying to make sure that the stories of um, marginalized groups that people are being told because of this American history, it's US history. But who are all the people that make up United States history? I want to make sure that everybody's story is told. So I think that's a space for me as a historian where I use that activism. And as an administrator, I'm trying to make sure that everybody has a seat at the table. I'm trying to cre create equity within the division, equity within departments, and try to show that there's space for all of us to be here because we are all part of this community. I have to ask, because I am just so in awe of all that you do, is it not a bit tiring? Do you ever... In, exhausting. Exhausting. <laughs> exhausting. Do you ever wonder what it would be like just to have the same expectations of your non-black counterparts? Do you yearn for that? Or do you take sort of a pride in it, really? That's the that's work that you have to do. Like, it, that's it's not, 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 it's not an it's option. Not. I don't even imagine that. I mean, seriously. It's not... I don't... There's not an envy there. It's just a way of being that you grow up in. Um, it's a way of being. It's not anything that you could say, well, I wanted like that, or I wish I had that. It's just, this is, this is the lot that I've been given. And because I write about enslaved people, I can never complain about whatever hardships I'm experiencing, because the stuff that I've read, 
the stuff that I've seen in the archives, the stuff that I've published, or the stuff that I, it was so difficult for me. I've read things that were so difficult, I literally got physically sick in the archives and could not finish work for weeks. Like I've had, I've been paralyzed by the things that I've read that, that have happened to our people. Um, so, no, I don't sit up here and think, oh, if I could have this, if I could have that. That's not an option for me yet. And I'm hoping that, and I do have hope in the next generation, the generations that come behind us. I saw it in my son, who's now a teenager, but I've seen it in the generations of, of youth. I saw it in the activism of, of young, um, young soon-to-be voters, you know, protesting and speaking. We saw a lot of that. That encourages me. And I, and I see the students and young kids don't see difference the way we, the way we acted out as adults. I see, you know, I talk to five-year-olds about slavery, and they're like, I don't understand why. I had a five-year-old say, well, why did, why did one group think that they had to work for the other group for free? I mean, the fact they asked the question, I think that's beautiful. Um, so they're trying to understand, like, the way of the world. And so, no, I do not think that wouldn't it be nice. That, that's not an option for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for the standing so proudly of that. I've never wondered what it would be like to be other than myself. I believe our existence is to improve it for the next generation, to educate you and understand to be average was never an option. To give up has never been an option. I understand that I carry a trauma, but I also carry within me the DNA of hope. And I lean into the hope. Continuing the idea of community, I'm wondering if both of you could speak more on how you have found your community here, how you found your space, these people who love you. This is a very difficult space to do that, Santa Barbara. We are an extreme minority. However, I think I have in a way found it. I think you guys have been at different times sort of a beacon of community. Other professors have been on this campus. What is that experience like? It has to be very intentional. I mean, you have to be intentional to follow up. Hey, would you like to meet for coffee? Hey, want to go see a movie? And you have to start to have a friend, no matter who you are, you have to be a friend, right? And, but I, I've noticed it's a lot of effort because it's not about just the people that look like you, but you want someone that um, empathizes and doesn't believe they know it all. But it's, a, it's an activism every day for not only my own survival, but the other people that are looking to survive. You have to be intentional about building a community. And I have to say, I've seen recently um, online that students are very lonely. It doesn't matter what nationality they come from, students are lonely. I've seen posts from students from UC Santa Barbara talking about being lonely. You know, and, and you don't know who's experiencing that. And I think that's, some of that's as a, re a result of the pandemic. But we have to reach out and build community with people that we don't know. Um, because sometimes people just need a friend. Or they need someone to ask you to go to coffee, or go on a walk, or just keep you company, or support somebody if they're giving a, a lecture or a talk or something. Just somehow let them know that you see them and you're, you're there for them. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you.